final subject here of Matthew 24 and 25, and that is don't be unfaithful. You see, all of us need to understand that Bible prophecy should affect our lifestyle, what we do, what we don't do. And so when you ask, what did Jesus tell us about the future? He told us not to be unfaithful. He gave some powerful illustrations and that which is not an illustration but the truth about God's coming judgment. And why? Take your Bibles, please. Turn to Matthew 25. And we'll start at verse uh, 14, where we left off this morning. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. And we'll read to the end of the chapter. Now, he starts off with a parable. The most common parables are what we call kingdom parables. Um, the kingdom of heaven is like. Okay? There's a lot of them. And they're all connected, if you understand Jewish thinking about marriage. They're all connected. But let's take a look at this one. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two. To another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth unto them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and, here's our word, faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth, and lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, except U.S. banks. <laughs> and then in my coming, I should have received mine own with usury. Just for, make sure we're all together here, usury is interest. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But for him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Please remember, those of you who have been with us, the end of chapter 24, the parable of the wise and wicked servant. He said the same thing. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered, and, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and 
clothe thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you took me not in, and naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous in the life eternal. Needless to say, that is an awesome passage in terms of consequences as it deals with being faithful to do what God wants you to do while we wait for the Son of Man to come. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the Bible. And thank you for this wonderful prophecy message by our Messiah, our Lord Yeshua. And I pray, God, you'd help us to understand the seriousness of being faithful to you. We're accountable to you. You're the Lord of all, the Lord above all, the Lord over all. We have no right to question you. We have no right to do our own thing or to act like we don't have any responsibility to you. God, please help us to understand, we pray. And all of us who know that something is wrong in our hearts, God, I pray by your powerful Holy Spirit, you would straighten it out right now. In the blessed name of our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. It's interesting, the effect of prophecy. A lady who was here this weekend came up to me and said, I came here with bitterness in my heart. And she started crying. And she said, after what I heard that our Lord said to us about the future, he said, I just fell apart. I have no right to be bitter about how people have treated me. I instead should be thinking about how I can be a blessing to others. And I thought, she hasn't even heard my last message yet. <laughs> so let's try to tackle this again. Several of you have told me, thank you for making things simple and easy to understand. Well, that's what we try to do, and that I consider to be a great compliment. That's what we're trying to do. We don't want to make it hard for you or for anyone. We want to make it as easy to understand as we can. This whole section that we just read about being faithful is really misunderstood. Let me tell you just why to start with before we even look at it. The reason being is that the one who is not faithful winds up in hell. Boy, I'll tell you, it bothers everybody who's been a student of the Word, who's studied that passage. Now, wait a minute. Maybe it'd be loss of reward. <laughs> that would be more comfortable for us. No. They wound up in hell. Wow. Pretty serious issue, so let's tackle it. First, what's the purpose of the parable? In verse 14, a kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country. I would put down two things if you were trying to understand the parable. One would be to explain the absence of the Lord. That's what our Lord was telling his disciples. I'm going to be gone. I'm not going to be here for a long time. But when I do come, I will come quickly. Meaning sudden, surprising, no time for you to prepare. Now while I'm gone, you need to understand what I want of you. That's the whole point here, to explain the absence of the Lord. And you can add a second thing to that, and that's to emphasize the accountability of the servants during his absence. This is my personal opinion. I hope you'll feel the same after you hear the teaching. I believe the lack of teaching in our churches about accountability to the Lord is causing a dilution of what commitment to Jesus Christ really means. Our Lord said, if you want to come after me, you deny yourself. And we got a whole culture trying to love themselves. <laughs> deny yourself, take up your cross daily. When you take up the cross, that's a one-way trip to death. Death to all your plans, death to your agenda, and hello, Lord, what would you have me to do? Take up your cross daily, and what? Follow me. 
and how many of us can easily say that verse, maybe have it memorized or repeat it often, and yet do nothing about it. That is an awesome verse as it relates to discipleship. It's a very important issue. Now, in Ephesians 5, it tells us we are to redeem the time because the days are evil. Colossians 4, 5 also makes the same point. In Luke 19, verse 11, it's obvious that the disciples believed that the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. When you come to Acts 1, 6 and 7, it confirms that belief. They said, Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, It's not for you to know the times or seasons that have been put in the Father's control, but you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Here's what I want you to do. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The great sin of the church of Jesus Christ is ignoring the world that desperately needs to know the message of the gospel. I don't know how you're involved in that. I don't know what you're doing with the stuff God's given you. The time, the talents, the treasure God's given you. I don't know what you're doing. But according to Jesus, it's pretty important. In the light of what is taking place in our world at the present time. This is not a time to go into our spiritual ghettos or have spiritual navel gazing in our church. This is a time not to get our act together, but to seek to reach lost men and women, boys and girls, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of our Lord. He's been saying it. He said repentance and remission of sins must be preached in all the world. We're not hearing it. There's something wrong in our midst. I know it's scary. I don't know about you, but in spite of what I know, it's always uncomfortable to try to begin a conversation with a total stranger about the gospel. But the world needs to know the truth. And we need to have the boldness of the Spirit of God to tell them. But think of how many of us have no understanding of our accountability to God in this matter. We just don't get it. And yet our Lord is telling us what to do in his absence. He has left us with some precious possessions time, treasure, talents, abilities, experiences that we have to be used for his honor and his glory. Now let's keep going. We have this whole argument of the possession of the talents. Now there are books that you can read, and I'm trying to bring this out to you so that we have balance here. But there are some Bible teachers who make a lot over whether it's five, two, or one, or whether it's 10, five, or one in the parable of the pounds in Luke. I personally do not make much of it. I think we miss the point when we do that. I do not believe that the Lord said there was a difference between the guy that had five and the guy that had two. Prove your point, David. Okay, I will. Verse 21, to the guy who had five and was very productive in increasing it, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Verse 23, to the one who had two, well done, good and faithful servant. Back to 21, you have been faithful over a few things. Verse 23, you have been faithful over a few things. Verse 21, I'll make thee ruler over many things. Verse 23, I'll make thee ruler over many things. Verse 21, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Same thing said to the man with two in verse 23. In other words, I don't want to belabor the point, but we are all different in terms of opportunities and responsibilities in this world as we wait for the coming of our Lord. As we get closer to the time, we need to accelerate and intensify our involvement. And that's a part of why I'm here. I'm not here for my health or yours. I am here to tell you the truth of what Jesus said. And we need to get serious about what he said. It's very, very important. So the possession of the talents, don't make more of it than you should. Like the guy with five could walk around and say, hey, nobody even came close to what I produced. No. Our Lord taught us that to whom much is given, much is required. And notice we are to be faithful in a few things, and then he'll make you ruler over many. It isn't a question of how much you've done or how many people you have reached. I learned that in teaching God's word. I love to teach the Bible. If I had 10 people, that's fine. If I have 10,000, it's fine. I've never seen the difference. I've held crusades of 300,000 people and more. I've seen thousands of people come to know the Lord around the world. 
but it doesn't matter whether it's three, four thousand, or four hundred thousand, or whether it's four people. The joy is in teaching the Word of God and being what God wants you to be. It's very, very important to understand that. People talk about a pastor, a pastor is talking about how big their church is. Listen, the, the basic factor in church life and growth is the sovereignty of God, not the talents of men. And a lot of us love good speakers. Well, who wouldn't? They're a lot better than the bad ones. <laughs> but if you've got a monotone and he teaches the Bible, you better hang on to him because there aren't many more teaching the Bible anymore. So we need to understand. Uh, so, so often we're self-centered in what we want or what we want to see accomplished. We need to back up a little bit. Every one of us has different opportunities. But what our Lord said to them was to be faithful in what God's given to you. Maybe it's the will of God that you only talk to 10 people your entire life. And some people would talk to 10,000. Is the one who talks to 10,000 more important than the one who talks to 10? The answer is no. That's the way our Lord runs things. And I thank God for it, don't you? What a wonderful joy to read that. I remember one time being invited to have a crusade in a town in, in Georgia. I went there and nine people showed up. The pastor began to explain that they didn't get enough advertising and all this stuff and all that, and if you don't want to preach, you know, we can just cancel it, the nine can go home. I said, no, God has a reason, I'm going to preach. Four of the nine professed faith in Jesus Christ that night. And some got in my heart. I don't care how many people there are, there's somebody God wants to talk to. And if most of you came to this meeting tonight and after hearing the message, you go home and say, well, I already knew that, so forth. Well, God bless you. But maybe there's a couple people here tonight to get their whole life changed. Amen? Amen. We need to be faithful in a few things and understand it. The possession of the talents is a crucial issue. And I want to show you what it's based on real quick. One, it's based on each servant's ability. Not somebody else. On your ability. I don't know what that is for you. I do know this, that a lot of people don't have much confidence in what the Lord could do through you. Remember this, God used Balaam's donkey so he could probably use you. <laughs> Amen? He says out of the mouth of babies he's ordained praise. He doesn't need you, he can have the rocks cry out. But the truth of the gospel is that he wants to use us. He wants to bless us more than we want to receive it. I think of people that God is greatly using. We were even talking at lunchtime about them. And I thought about a free speech platform. Years ago, I was involved in that. It was at California State University in Long Beach. And it was about 1,000 people, and I was speaking on who is Jesus. And over the corner, leaning against a building and muttering, and it was really the school fool, was a Vietnam veteran who was smoked out by drugs and was really out of his mind. But that day, he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God could clean up his life and save him. And that long hair idiot, and he was that, gave his heart to the Lord. And he eventually became my college pastor, one of the great preachers of the gospel. He's now head of a worldwide foreign missionary group and travels all over the world preaching the gospel. But I remember the silly looking kid who was <laughs> bombed out with drugs from Vietnam. You see, God knows what he's going to do. And he might use you in a different way than you thought. I think of Pearl Kashishian, of Kashishian Oriental Rugs. When she got to be 86, she got very ill with cancer. They put her in the hospital. She called me one day and said, you know, I've never done anything for the Lord. That wasn't quite true, but anyway, that's what she thought. Like a lot of us, you know, I've never done much. And I said, well, what do you want to do, Pearl? She said, well, bring me some tracts and booklets and I'll see what I can do here in the hospital. I didn't think much about it, so I put a few together and brought it into her room, and she said, well, you've got a lot of faith. <laughs> I told you to bring me a bunch of books, and you bring me a handful? Come on. <laughs> well, I'll shorten the story up. She was there for several months. She led 15 doctors to the Lord, many nurses, people all over the hospital. When she could no longer move, and the attendant had to pick her up, her little emaciated body, and put it in a wheelchair so she could motor to the next room and tell more people about the Lord. It's an incredible story. There's a book on her life called Pearl, written by Danita Dyer. My point is this. Be very, very careful how you judge this issue that Jesus said. You're going to be judged according to the ability that God has given you. And don't ever relate it to somebody else's. Everybody is unique and different. Number two, remember that it's based also on your accountability to the Lord. 
That's what the parable's all about. We aren't accountable to other people, but a lot of us live in that kind of fear. We're intimidated by what people think about us. Hey, you gotta stop that stuff. We're accountable to the Lord and the Lord alone. A blind lady came up to me several years ago and said, well, I can't do anything with the Lord, for the Lord. I said, well, sure you can. So we thought for a moment, and I said, what do you like to do? And she said, she was so cute. She said, I really like to talk. You know, most women do, and I just love to talk. I said, well, you got a phone. I, we found out the phone book was in Braille. She went and started with the A's and went through the entire phone book. Now, some people slammed the phone down, but she had the joy of leading people to Christ so much so every week she'd call me and tell me. Uh, it's hard to believe. But that woman found out something she could do. We're accountable to the Lord. We're going to answer to him. You understand this? You're not going to answer to anybody else. So stop wanting everybody else's approval. It's a waste of time. Also, it's based on acceptance by the Lord. The Lord is a judge. He's the one that's going to accept what you have done. And here's the good news. His standards are different than anybody you've ever met. You ready? A cup of cold water given in his name will receive a reward. What's the point of that? Remember Jews, when they tell you an illustration, they exaggerate for effect. And every one of us would think, well, what's a cup of water? Well, it's something to the Lord. You see, we need to understand it's the little things that count. They add up. A cup of cold water, given his name, will receive a reward. Here's another one. Whatever you've done for the Lord, he's going to reward you 100 times more. Wow. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things the Lord has prepared for those that love him. God wants to bless your socks off, and you can get another pair. But the fact is, he is the one who accepts the little that you bring. That little boy's lunch, five barley loaves, give me a break, you feed animals with that. Two little fish. The disciples offered the typical church question. What are they among so many? 5,000 men not counting the women and children. Come on, it could have been a crowd of 20,000 or more. But you see, little is much when it's in the hand of the Lord. And he just started breaking it, but it wouldn't stop. Isn't it amusing to see that he had 12 baskets full at the end? Why were there 12 baskets full? Because how many disciples were there? 12. One for each of them to realize they didn't even understand what God could do. That's so important to understand here in the parable and the teaching of our Lord concerning it. Now there's a prerequisite of the Lord's commendation. What is it? We've already read it, but I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. The prerequisite is to be faithful. That's what the message is here that Jesus gave us for the future. What do we do while we wait for him? And he hasn't come yet. What do we do? We're going to be faithful. Faithful in what? In the few things that God gives to us. Now in 1 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, Paul makes a tremendous argument on this. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Let a man so account of us as the ministers or the servants of Christ and stewards. He told a lot of parables about stewards. Stewards were given possessions, households to manage in the behalf of the Lord or their owner. We are stewards of what? Of the mysteries of God, which are now recorded in the New Testament. Paul spoke about several of them. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man receive his doctor's degree as soon as possible. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the perverted version. <laughs> I had a church call me back in the Midwest just last week, and they want to get a pastor. And they say, do you know any educated pastors? <laughs> I said, most of the good ones are educated beyond their intelligence. Now, I think I have a right to say that with three earned doctorates. I think I have a right to talk that way. Amen? Maybe you don't, but I do. And I'm telling you, we're dying by degrees. Some of the stupidest people I've ever known in my life are those that got doctor's degrees. The greatest lesson God ever gave me is the first time I got a doctor's degree, I walk off the stage, they move the little tassel, and I have my diploma. And my oldest son, who's now in his 40s, going to be an old man. But anyway, he uh, was a little kid at that time. And he said, Dad, what's that? I said, that's a doctor's degree. He said, does that mean you can heal people? I said, no, son, it's not that kind of degree. He said, then what good is it? <laughs> I learned, 
Because that boy told the truth that day. Okay? So when he told you what to do, he says it's required. What is required? Faithfulness. In other words, the greatest ability is to be faithful to what God has given you. Think about that in relationship to marriage. You know how to have a great marriage? Just be faithful to what God told you to do. Amen? Well, he told me to put notes all over the house and in the kitchen and open the refrigerator. My husband can see them. I've got a little Bible with a presentation there. No, that isn't what he told you to do. He told you to have a meek and quiet spirit. That's what he said. Husbands, you know, they tell me all the time, oh, if you knew my wife, you'd know why I got a bad marriage. Are you kidding me? When guys come in and they want counseling for marriage, I don't do it anymore. It's a waste of time. But anyway, when they come in, it's so funny. It's so funny the way guys do it. And you girls, you, you, don't, don't overemphasize this to any man here. But guys are strange. They come in, they never talk about the issue, ever. They come in, they say, hey, how about those Lakers? <laughs> what? Are we here to discuss how they're doing? I mean, it's unbelievable how guys are. They beat around the bush and, hey, it's hot, right? You know, I mean, they say anything and everything. You go through the weather, politics, everything. And I said, why are you in here? Oh, uh, my wife wants me to come. <laughs> Your wife wants you to come. Oh, great. This is going to be a thrilling session, I'm sure. <laughs> but these guys, they're so funny. One guy told me, he said, you know, Pastor, i got to get a divorce. I said, why? He said, I, I just don't love her anymore. You don't love your wife anymore. I said, well, you don't need a divorce. Well, well, what do you mean? I said, all we need to do is find out what God says about love. I'll help you to love your wife. So you don't know her. I said, I don't intend to. And I said, you need to memorize 1 Corinthians 13. Learn what love is. You can love anybody on the face of the earth with God's help. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to hear the men. Amen? Yeah. It's all always oh, amazing to me. You're talking about marriage and all the women respond. <laughs> I wrote a book called Proverbs for Today, 16 Problems in a Man's Life. Women are the ones that buy the book. <laughs> Number four, what is the promise of the Lord to those faithful servants? What did he say? I cannot tell you. Um, without you studying the Bible about how wonderful this statement is. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Psalm 1611 says, In his presence is fullness of joy, and in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. But according to the Bible, if you'll be faithful to what God has given you, you have no idea how God is going to bless you and fill your heart with joy as you begin to see how God can take the smallest little thing that you do for him and make a harvest out of it. We need to trust the Lord. Well, we got a problem here, though, and that's the problem of the one-talent servant. What do we do about the one-talent servant? Let's notice a few things about him in verses 24 to 27. What do we learn about this one-talent servant? Number one, we learn he has apathy. He's indifferent. He did nothing with the opportunity that he had. He didn't do anything with it. That's like a lot of us. We never do anything. God may put in your mind to write somebody and cheer them up or encourage them to go visit somebody as the Lord has described. And you don't do anything. You're apathetic. You're indifferent. You never do anything about it. We need to change that. Secondly, his attitude was extremely wrong. Imagine telling the Lord, well, I knew you were a hard man to work with. Are you kidding? He accused his master of bad character and undeserved profits. You know what? I have heard that out of the mouth of people who are employees in companies. And you get ticked off and mad that the owners of those companies are making money off the company they started. <coughs> the Bible suggests a different method. We ought to thank God we have a job. More so now than ever. His attitude. Third, we have his actions. They revealed his own character. He's described as a wicked and a slothful servant. If you want a good little Bible study here, go to the book of Proverbs and look up the word slothful every single time it's used. It's all the way through the book. He's talking about an undisciplined person, 
who doesn't care anything about the responsibilities he has in life, he's just going to do nothing and live off the benefits of others. May God help us. We're developing a whole culture like that, in my opinion. A young kid, 16 years old, came up to me and he said, I got a real problem. I said, what's that? He said, I don't think my dad's going to give me anything. I said, what are you talking about? Well, I, he's got a lot of stuff. He could, he could give me some of it. I said, you know, there's a story about a young man in the Bible who felt that way. He said, there is? Yeah. We call him the prodigal son. He said, I, I don't know why, but I have a feeling this is not going to be good. <laughs> oh, yes. God has a lot of truth that we ignore. What, are you looking for a handout? You know, it's amazing, our attitudes in society today. I look back on, <laughs> this is kind of a funny story, but I'll try to make it real quick. Uh, I worked my way through college, bought my first car, um, paid for it all, and then I later found out my dad could have bought the school. <laughs> now that causes problems in your heart. I couldn't believe it. When he died, 1969, I had to take over the oil business for a while. And I saw his handwritten accounting records. He was supporting over 200 missionaries by himself. He had established over 16 church properties that he himself had bought and schools. He was a wealthy man, but he never known it. He kept driving an old truck and old overhauls that were dirty and filthy. Except on Sunday, he would dress up on Sunday. He put a little rose in his lapel and he would go down and greet people at the church because he said it, the pastor wasn't good at it. <laughs> oh, I, I never knew how many kids were in our family. There was only one other one, a, a brother who's 10 years older than I was, but I didn't know because my dad kept winning people to Christ and bringing them home. They'd stay for weeks sometimes. I said, are those people family? You know? But you know, we all need to learn. We all need to learn. Be very, very careful about slothfulness, being undisciplined, expecting people to do things for you. Just get that out of your heart. It's more important to be a friend than to have one. Never forget it. The sixth major thing that we need to look at is the principle that Yeshua taught about the kingdom. Look at verse 28 and 29. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. The guy with five had got five more. That's why he's got ten. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But for him that hath not, you've never done anything with what God gave you, it'll be taken away even that which he hath, and you wind up with nothing. Wow. That's a little strong. Those who are faithful in using the opportunities God has given to them will receive more of them to use for his glory and to bear fruit for him. You do nothing and God will take away even the opportunities that you had. Wow. But if you think that's bad, how about this? Verse 30. Every Bible teacher I know is troubled about this verse. What do you do with a servant who didn't do anything with what God gave him? Answer, cast him into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The guy's going to hell. You say, well, that doesn't seem right. Who are you to judge? Maybe the whole problem is we have forgotten how important it is for us to do in this world what God... I've often thought of this. If God doesn't want you to do something, then why doesn't he take you home the moment you get saved? Of course, if he did that, the question is, why are we all still here? God left you and me here for a reason. Amen? Amen. I think of all the great servants of the Lord who died as young people. I made a list of those under 35 who served the Lord greatly and died. It's huge. It's huge. Some of the greatest servants of the Lord died before they ever got to 35. Some of them in their 20s, and you can hardly believe who it is. We need to wake up. Do what you can. The night cometh when no man can work. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Do whatever you can with the opportunities that God has given you. 
And don't treat what God has given to you like the unprofitable servant. Here's the point. The point is that his attitudes reveal he had an unbelieving heart. And don't tell me there aren't people in our midst who are unbelievers. The Lord said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, that many will say to me, Lord, Lord, haven't we done wonderful works in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. We can act like we're in the in group and we have our ticket to heaven, but something is wrong. That's why the whole book of James is important. Can faith that has no fruit and no works, can that save you? And James says, no, it cannot. Do you have to have works in order to get saved? No. But if you have real saving faith, it will produce in a person's life the works that will honor God. And you'll be accountable to him. When there's nothing flowing out of your life, not one blooming thing, you are giving evidence of an unbelieving heart, no matter how many of your family and friends you say, I really know the Lord. Really? Do you really? The Bible says in Ephesians 2, as you know, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that is not of yourself. That's salvation by grace. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God has ordained that we would walk in them. I love to tell people your works won't save you. I love to tell people the truth of the gospel of grace and God's grace. But there's another side of this that we've been ignoring for a long time. If you really are born again, it's going to show in your life. Which brings us to the place of judgment. It's amazing to me in this prophecy message how the Lord just kept moving. In a certain way, gently with his disciples, but pointedly and drawing them to an understanding. And he winds up with the fact that he, as the judge of all, for the Father has committed all judgment to the Son, we're going to stand before him, our Lord Jesus. He is the judge. And what he does here is tell us that all nations, all people in the world, are going to be judged by the Lord. Every last one of them. Let's just ask some simple questions. When will this judgment take place? Look at your Bible, chapter 25, and verse 31. When will this judgment take place? And it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him. That's when it's going to take place. In other words, it will be at the end of the day of the Lord that he's been discussing. It will be at the end of the tribulation period. That's what the Bible tells us. And all nations are going to be judged by God. Now, a second little question where will this judgment take place? Where? What does it say? It says he will sit, verse 31, on the throne of his glory. Joel chapter 3 says that he's going to set up a throne in the valley of Jehoshaphat. That is between the Mount of Olives and the Mount that we call the Temple Mount. It's where the Kidron Valley is, where the Brook Kidron flows. And in that valley is where multitudes, Joel said, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision there's going to be a judgment of all nations by the Lord and that's where it's going to take place number three who's going to be judged verse 32 before him shall be gathered how many nations what does it say all nations the word nation also is translated as Gentiles so a lot of my Jewish friends try to get out of this <laughs> But no, I think everybody's included. Now the next question is why will this judgment take place? Why? And we have several answers to that here in this passage. First, to divide believers from non-believers. You talk about a Jewish illustration, this is it, sheep and goats. Many times, in fact I have a lot of pictures in my Holy Land files, you're traveling in a tour bus and you're going along the road and you see a shepherd with goats and sheep. The amazing thing to me is where did Jesus say the sheep were? On the right. And the goats are... Did you know that's exactly the way they walk behind the shepherd? Now who told him to do that? Huh? The goats get together and say, hey, let's stay on the left side. So when he told the story, everybody listening knew exactly what he was talking about. 
That's true. He's going to divide believers from non-believers. You may have thought you fooled him. No, you didn't fool him. He knows everybody, knows their hearts, knows whether they're really in the uh, camp of the believers or not. And that's what's going to happen. There's a second reason, and that's to, de to demonstrate the importance of a genuine faith. Verse 35 and 36, he told him, when I was hungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave And all of this, I was a stranger, and you clothed me. And I was in prison, you visited. Well, when do we do that? When you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren. That's when you did it. In other words, what we have done with the opportunities God has given us, he knows all about. They're the proof of whether we really have a genuine faith or not. And he also gave us this teaching to declare what caring for the needs of others really means to our Lord. I don't know how many of you will respond to what I am saying. I really don't know. But I know this. This is not the only passage in my Bible that tells me to care for those in need. You know how evangelical Bible-believing Christians got out of this mess? They called it the social gospel. So they stayed away from it because it was run by liberals primarily who didn't believe the fundamental doctrines of salvation in the Bible. But what happened was we created a generation of believers that don't do much for the Lord. Wow. James 2, if you see a, a brother in need and he's hungry, what do you say? Be ye warmed and filled and give him not the things needful for, for the body? Uh, it says, then how does the love of God dwell in you? In other words, it's a question about whether you know the Lord or not. We have the same problem in 1 John chapter 3. If you never do anything for anybody in need, what are you revealing? You're revealing there's something wrong. It, a born-again heart cares. Our Lord is telling us that. We care about the needs of people. The Bible tells us, do good to the household of faith especially, but do good to all men. What have you done for anybody who is an unbeliever that would cause them to know that you must be a believer by the kindness you've shown them? Wow. But there's a fourth thing we must say to you, and that is to the purpose, and that is to develop an awareness of the Lord's care and concern for the Jewish people. Every single Bible teacher I know, in all their commentaries, points out that our Lord's words are pretty clear. When you've done it to one of the least of these, my brethren. If you don't know the context of Matthew 24 and 25 is centering in Israel, then you will say, oh, he must be talking about other church members, so I only do good to them. No. He's talking about his brethren, his kinsmen, according to the flesh. Our Lord was Jewish. What's the point of that? Do you remember back in chapter 24 when we started? We mentioned the anti-Semitic attitudes that are going to develop, and Israel will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Care and concern for the Jewish people? Aren't they bankers? Wow. You see, they are the elect of Matthew 24, 21, and 22. This is emphasizing to all of us that the Lord meant what he said in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. That's what he said. You want to be blessed in your life? Then develop care and concern for Jewish people. Here is the greatest misunderstanding of the church. I asked this at a seminar once, and I got a little shot, shot down and shocked by the response. I found out that we would rather care for other Gentile believers in the body of Christ than to do anything for any Jewish people. And it really broke my heart. You know, Jews are hard to love. Did you know that? We're all a little caustic. We push and sh shove people on the subways of New York. And uh, we're suspicious of everybody who's not Jewish. We don't trust you. And we know what you have done to us all these years. And it'd be interesting to you to come with me to regular Jewish synagogues. I'm not talking about Messianic believers. I'm invited all the time to go. You'd be interested to see what they talk about. 
about the phony, hypocritical Gentile Christians who never do anything for the Jewish people. They know what the Bible says. Don't you know that? If you want to really reach them, you're going to have to love them in spite of how awful they are to love. <coughs> Let me put it to you this way. I knew that the majority of you were Gentiles when I came in here tonight. How did I know that? Well, I said to some of you, hey, how are you? And you answered, fine, as a Gentile. <laughs> when I ask my Jewish friends, how are you? You know what they say? Why do you ask? <laughs> Why, you think I have a problem? And I, no, I say you have a problem before you know we're in an argument. I don't know how it happens. We're raised this way. We learn how to argue right off the bat. Even if we agree with you, we play the other side. But I'll tell you a little secret about Jewish people, the most cantankerous among them. If you show love to them and care for them, you'll have a friend for life. They'll never forget it. Never. That's what Jewish people are like. And Jewish people believe they're all alone in this world. We have to protect ourselves. Because the world out there wants to kill us and wipe us off the face of the earth. They hear it all the time. Now, there are many, many agencies that try to help people. There are, for instance, the International Fellowship of Jews and Christians is run by Rabbi Ikel Eckstein. He is not a believer in Yeshua, but he is certainly favorable to discussing it. He speaks to evangelical churches all the time. The reason I'm mentioning it, this is the number one ministry to which evangelical Christians give money. Did you know that? Last year, we gave over $92 million dollars to help elderly Jewish people get to Israel and, and live, have somebody take care of them. Evangelical believers, God bless them. There are all kinds of agencies that work with Jewish people and try to help them. And I have people tell me all the time, well, are they Christians? No. Well, then we shouldn't do it. Are you kidding? The Lord told us to do good to all men, especially those are of the household of faith. And is there anyone that the Lord wants us to minister to with our love, our care, our provisions? Yes, he wants you to minister to Jewish people. I've got an old man who came to know the Lord. He was a Jewish man. And a little kid heard me preach on this. And he's just a little boy. And he went over and mowed his lawn. And he came out there and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm mowing your lawn. Why are you doing that? Because you're the only Jew I know. <laughs> he told me he heard the sermon. So the Jewish man calls me on the phone and said, what'd you tell these kids? I said, well, I told him what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? He said, well, he told us to really care for Jewish people. He did? The following Sunday, he was in church. After about three months of hearing me wax and yell at him, he came to know the Lord. Because of a little boy that went over there and mowed his lawn. Listen, friends. Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. People ask me all the time, why are you going speaking at these regular Jewish synagogues? Because I want to see every last Gentile and Jew in this world come to faith in the Jewish Messiah. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep going on. I had a funny experience with six Calvary Chapel pastors who were with me on a Holy Land tour. And we, <laughs> we were at the Wailing Wall. Underneath the Wailing Wall, there are these yeshiva, little study groups. of, uh, And inside there, they have a room called the Holy of Holies. It's not the real one, of course. But it says Holy of Holies. And the walls are lined with Torahs, beautiful Torahs from around the world throughout history. And that's where the chief rabbi goes. Well, anyway, we're down there by the Wailing Wall, and I know some of those guys. They came up and said, hey, David, how are you? I said, fine. And uh, they said, is there anything we can do for you while you're here? I said, yeah. I said, I'd really like to see the chief rabbi. Never met him. He said, well, you know, it's funny. He's here today. I said, he is, yeah. He's right back in the Holy of Holies. I said, hmm, I'd like to see him. He said, well, you stay right here. Now, these six Calvary Chapel pastors, their mouths have already dropped. They're saying, you're kidding. I said, no, well, just be quiet, be cool. <laughs> and, uh, so he came back and he said, he wants to see you. He knows a lot about you. I said, really? Okay. 
So I start to go in, and the six Calvary Chapel pastors are going, ahem, ahem, ahem. don't forget us. I said, is it okay if they come and they keep their mouth shut? The guy said, yeah, why, are they Gentiles? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we go in there to the Holy of Holies, and I go in there, and I see this man, I think he's seated at the end of this long table. He wasn't, he was standing. He's a little tiny guy. His head, he comes up to my waist. And he comes up to me and he says, oh, David, David, I've heard so much about you. I've wanted to meet you. I said, I want to meet you. Next thing out of his mouth, have you been anointed? The pastor said, oh, I don't believe that. I said, keep quiet. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I think I have been anointed because the Bible teaches that we have received an anointing from the Lord, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. He said, well, do you want to get a little bit more? I said, sure, I'll take anything you got. <laughs> So he starts to put his hands, and he can't reach me. He says, you kneel. Besides, it'll be good for you. Get down. So I kneel. He lays his hands on me, pours oil over my head. While these pastors are sitting there, they're in shock. And uh, he said, he, oh, wonderful prayer. The mighty power of the Holy Spirit will fall on him, and he'll not be afraid of anybody in this world. Boy, I love that prayer. It was great. So I got up, and I said, can I pray for you? What are you going to say? <laughs> I said, are you worried? He said, a little bit that you're going to throw in all that Yeshua stuff. <laughs> I said, I have to. I believe he's the Messiah of Israel. OK, you pray. And so I prayed for him that he'd come to know the true Messiah, our Lord Yeshua. He was give his heart to him. I finished the prayer, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, he was our best rabbi. <laughs> I said, I take it you're not going to go for the Son of God thing. He said, no. I said, well, I pray that you will. You pray all you want. I want your prayers. But I was thinking to myself, as we walked out, these Calvary pastor guys could hardly walk. They were so shaken. And they're going out. And they said, I, I don't believe we have seen what we just saw. And I said, you know, the Lord told us to really care for Jewish people, to pray for them. Paul spoke that he had a broken heart for them. And the one pastor who's written me since then, he said, my life was changed that day as I realized I didn't care squat about any Jew. <coughs> now he's got people coming to his church. You know what? Jewish people know whether you love them or not. They're hard to love, but they know whether you really love them. And that's what our Lord said. Hey, I'm not done. We've got to quit. What will be the result of this judgment? Now we're going to be done. What is the result? That is shocking. Once again, like those parables in chapter 24, the results are shocking indeed. What our Lord did often is expose people who thought by their efforts they were somehow in the kingdom of God. That was Jewish Pharisee talk. But he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Our Lord constantly warned us about just saying the words and acting like we're in the end group and we've never been born again. So what do we learn here? The sheep nations. What did he say? Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from when? The foundation of the world. God has a plan. The goat nations? Everlasting fire. Everlasting punishment. Is hell forever? Yes, it is. People say, well, I don't like messages on hell. Well, I don't either, but we got to teach them. Why? Because our Lord told us more about that than he did about heaven. I don't want anybody to go there. When my wife and I were married, on both sides of our family, we had a lot of folks who didn't know the Lord. It made our holidays terrible. We couldn't wait until they were over so we could get out of there and go visit some Christian friends for a while. But the Lord, somewhere along the line, changed my attitude. And I decided these were opportunities. They would always ask me, let's have David say the prayer. It was the way they said it ticked me off. <laughs> but I finally realized it was an opportunity, so the prayers were quite long. <laughs> I had to put the whole gospel in it. <laughs> to the glory of God, every last relative on both sides came to know the Lord, some the day before they died. <laughs> Look, friends, be faithful in a few things, and I'll make you ruler over many. Don't get upset and bitter. Don't, don't resent what God brings into your life, whether it's suffering or pain or whatever. God has a purpose. 
Some of you have asked me about the pain I'm under. I take pain pills to even preach, okay? I've had arthritis from the bottom of my neck or through my pelvic area. MRI shows it's solid white. Had it for over 40 years. But you know, I got a doctor who wants to do surgery on me. I'm not going to let him. But God wanted me to share Christ. His wife is now coming to hear me teach. And he went out because he wants to understand the Bible. He went out and bought Spiro Zodiades, his two-volume set. He hadn't had the foggiest idea what to do with it. And I said, well, you bring it to the office, and the next time I come to see you, which is going to be the next couple of weeks, I'll show you how to use it. He said, would you really? I said, yeah. I said, besides, your wife wants you to know the subject of the Bible. Really? What's that? Uh, it's about Jesus and about going to heaven instead of hell. He looked at me and said, you're kidding. I said, no. You can tell me how to go to heaven? I sure can. Well, I'm busy right now. Well, <laughs> I just hope the Lord is gracious to you. I'll tell you next time. Besides, I'm busy and I haven't got time to talk to you. He looked at me and said, you're lying. You would talk to me in a minute, wouldn't you? I said, yep. I said, the only reason I'm here is not for you to operate on me. It's because the Lord wants to reach your heart. This guy's got tears in his eyes. I gotta get out of here. And I'm in his office. <laughs> weird, weird, weird. I wanna tell you two things and we're out of here. Just remember that what we had taught us here about the goat nations was separation from the Lord forever. Depart from me, the Lord said. Man. And secondly, suffering forever in hell. That's what my Lord said. And it ought to do something to our hearts. Amen. And to be faithful in serving our Lord.